Live from downtown Salt Lake City, the Utah Debate Commission welcomes you to the second Congressional District Candidates Debate. Good evening, I'm Pat Jones, and it is my pleasure to moderate tonight's debate at the invitation of the Utah Debate Commission. This event, held live on October 19th, is part of the Utah Debate Commission's work to educate voters and encourage the civil exchange of ideas. If you're watching or listening live, we encourage your reactions and questions on social media using the hashtag UTDebates and ListenLearnVote. We are broadcasting live from the KSL Broadcast House, where we are holding the debate between candidates in Utah's race for the second congressional district. For the safety of all involved in the debate process, we are adhering to social distancing guidelines and there is no studio audience. Tonight, we will hear from Republican candidate, Congressman Chris Stewart and his challengers, Democrat Kale Weston and Libertarian Robert Latham. Tonight's questions will be posed by myself, students from Southern Utah University, members of the news media, and the viewing audience participating on social media. Candidates will have up to two minutes for a response and an opportunity for a 30-second rebuttal or follow-up question. Last week, a random draw determined that Mr. Weston will get the initial response to the first question. We will proceed alphabetically and then alternate who answers first on the remaining questions. Let's get right into the questions now. You know, it's important for every voter to know something personal about the candidates. I'd like to know, and I know the audience would like to know, what uniquely qualifies you to represent the second congressional district, Mr. Weston? Thank you, Pat, the commission, students helping, my opponents and everyone at home. In my former State Department career, I had the honor of representing our country, including seven consecutive years in Iraq and Afghanistan, where I was almost killed numerous times. What I learned in both wars is straightforward. Bad policies and bad leaders can result in unnecessary deaths. We saw that in Iraq. Tragically, we are seeing it now with COVID. This election is a referendum of Donald Trump, the poisonous politics of fear and division a president turning us against each other, disrespecting our allies, and attacking our health care. Chris Stewart said Trump was, quote, our Mussolini. Over the last four years, he has acted as Mussolini's representative to Utah. This election, we must fire Trump and his collaborators. Only then can we begin to make America kind and ethical again, respect it again, a welcoming country of bridges, not walls. Thank you, I look forward to an honest debate based on facts and our record. Thank you, Mr. Weston. Mr. Latham, one minute. Sure, and thank you, Pat. Uh, if I didn't know the Utah legislature any better, I might believe anyone who said the second congressional district was drawn for me. I was born at Holy Cross Hospital, uh, uh, now Salt Lake Regional Medical Center. Grew up in Salt Lake. Um, after coming back from college, uh, I lived in several Salt Lake neighborhoods. I then lived in Bountiful for several years before relocating to Southern Utah in 2011. My family plot is across Fifth South from Rice Eccles Stadium, so I anticipate that my final resting place will be in the second congressional district. My law practice takes me up and down uh, I-15 and courts across Utah. Maybe it was the receiving the Kiwanis Club's Hope for America Award growing up that put me on this path, or maybe it was my much later experience in public affairs and government relations that opened my eyes to how certain firms launder the oligarchy's propaganda. So it just seems like the right thing to do to give our community a real choice rather than the false choice between Imperialist Party A and Imperialist Party B. Mr. Stewart, one minute. Thank you, thank the Commission, Pat, it's good to see you. We miss your husband, he was a dear friend and uh, we appreciate the Commission, we appreciate my opponents and for all of you who are listening and watching at home. It's hard to answer that question if you have a sense of humility, but it's with humility, but I think a great deal of confidence that I can tell you that uh, of the gentlemen who are appearing here on the stage, I am by far the most qualified to represent this district. And I think it comes down to a couple things. One, are you a person of integrity? Are you willing to work hard? Do you listen to others? I remember having a town hall not far from here where there were a thousand angry, screaming people who didn't agree with me on nearly anything, but I felt I had to give them the opportunity to hear that or to listen to them. But more than that, I'm a conservative. I believe in the future of America. I believe in the right to life, religious freedom, 
I believe that socialism is a bad idea and that, yeah, you have a right to protest, but you don't have a right to riot and to burn and to intimidate and violence. Those are the things we're going to talk about tonight, and, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. The next question goes to Mr. Latham, 90 seconds, on COVID. The COVID-19 pandemic is on the minds of everyone. The Trump administration has delegated the responsibility of dealing the pandemic to the states. Do you think the federal government has a role to play in dealing with the pandemic, yes or no? And if yes, what is the role of the federal government? Uh, the, the short answer is no, Pat. I don't believe that the federal government has a role to play in here. Um, Congress's powers are limited by Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, and nowhere in that section of the Constitution does it authorize Congress to get, get involved in this area. Um, I'm not a medical doctor. I try to live healthy, keep my immunity up, uh, take precautions when I'm out in the community. Um, healthcare providers in a free society would have had testing underway early on but it was the Federal Food and Drug Administration and the CDC that said no and interfered with that testing effort. This is an example of what we call regime uncertainty. When a state interferes with our ability to make informed decisions, keeping us in the dark, and then marginalize us for not seeing the light. When there was a shortage of N95 masks, many manufacturers wanted to uh, help to meet the demand, but politically privileged holders of the right to make N95 masks wouldn't let others produce them. So there's still a shortage. In a liberated, free market healthcare system, the duopoly can extort campaign contributions from drug and medical device manufacturers and healthcare providers. So here we are with a future uncertain because too many have failed to say no to big government and the pandemic industrial complex. The spread of communicable diseases is a case of a tragedy of the commons. And that tragedy will continue if we continue to tolerate the state's inability to adequately regulate common areas. Thank you. Mr. Stewart, same question, 90 seconds. Yeah, look, um, I just disagree. I think the federal government has not only a role, but, a, but an important role. And before we talk about the details, let's do, I think, something all of us want to do, and that's recognize we're at 215,000 Americans who have passed away. They have left broken hearts, broken families. It's a tragedy for, for many people. President Trump had a responsibility to act, and he did. I was at the White House sometime in late February. It was kind of late at night, 9.30 at night, and there was a lot of activity, and I said, what's going on? I said, we're creating the Coronavirus Task Force. Shortly after that, the president announced a travel ban from China, which was the right thing to do. Immediately after that, Vice President Biden accused him of racism, of xenophobia, said it was the wrong policy. Nancy Pelosi goes down to Chinatown and says, come on down, there's nothing to worry about. But the president acted, and then he did even more. And this is very important. Operation Warp Speed, I think, is one of the great examples of a success story. We're not going to develop a, an immunization in 10 or 12 years. We're going to do it in 8 or 10 months. We've driven down the mortality rate from this 60% in 7 months. This is a remarkable success. Now, was it perfect? It, clearly it wasn't. Were there things that we could have done better? Yeah, there were, both Republicans and Democrats, governors and the president. But I think that we're on a pathway now that I think we can look back and say, thank heaven that we've been able to take the steps that the president did take in order to protect as many people as he could. Mr. Weston, same question, 90 seconds. I absolutely disagree with, with both of my opponents on this question. Mr. Stewart calls this a remarkable success. Utah is number four in the country for COVID infections. The United States of America is number one in terms of deaths as well as eight million Americans infected, including my brother and two nephews. All of us at home, whether in Washington County and you're a senior, or single working mothers, or minority communities, or communities of color in the west side of, of Salt Lake need to be asking a fundamental question. How many Americans didn't need to die? How many Americans did not need to get affected? The president has pulled us out of the World Health Organization. A global pandemic cannot be solved by the United States alone. The president was recorded telling Mr. Woodward in February, quote, this is deadly stuff. It's communicable in the air. They, Trump and Stewart, did not trust us with the truth. Uh, this is a clear difference between me and my two opponents. I believe the federal government has a hugely important role, but according to my libertarian friend and my Republican friend, they've decimated the apolitical nature of the CDC. They've undercut the role of the World Health Organization and they've played games with our health. 
So I, I wholeheartedly believe we need to do a lot better so that no one dies who doesn't need to die and no one gets infected who doesn't need to get infected. Thank you. And if I may respond. Everybody. Thank you. 30 seconds. Sure. So we, we, I think the libertarian perspective here is that when it comes to, for example, alcohol and tobacco, because we view prohibition as so much more harmful than the harm that we're prohibiting, we, fe we feel that it's better to be punished by that, the outcomes of, of those exposures rather than, again, uh, prohibit alcohol, prohibit drugs. We know that there are costs to those prohibitions. We should be mi mindful of the relative risk. We need to factor in that some may not act as responsibly as most of us would like to, kind of like with defensive driving. But I think with those obstacles to accountability removed, a spontaneous order emerges and we're safer as a result. Rebuttal from Mr. Stewart. Yeah, it's hard to do in 30 seconds, but look, you can't have it both ways. You can't criticize the president for the action he took to protect the American people and then say, A, we're going to do more of that. We're going to, we're going to lock things down, destroy the economy, and we would not have shut down travel from China. But, uh, but also you have to look at the other people who have had responsibility to this. Democratic governors who put uh, COVID positive patients in a nursing home. That cost tens of thousands of lives. Operation Warp Speed was a remarkable success. There's no question about it. Again, you develop a vaccine not in 10 or 12 years, you're gonna do it in a few months, drive down the mortality rate. That is a remarkable thing. That's a positive thing. Let's not politicize virtually everything about this. Let's be able to say, yeah, you know what? We did some things that were good and don't criticize for some of the others, which by the way, they would have continued to do. Thank you. 30 second rebuttal from Mr. I'm, Weston. I'm a fact-based candidate. I'm a nonfiction writer. I believe in telling the truth. Um, the White House is a super spreader location, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. It didn't need to be. Three dozen or so people got COVID because of an event there where no one wore masks. Unfortunately, masks have become politicized. They should never have been politicized. Even an event today, there were many people at a Trump rally without masks on. To me, this is about our public health, and if you hire me, I will put your health first. Thank you. We have a, a video from an SUU student, Victoria Stevens Carr. This will go to Mr. Stewart for one minute. Hi, my name is Victoria Stevens Carr. I am a student at Southern Utah University. In the past year, Washington and Iron Counties have seen an increase in unemployment by 40%. To assist those impacted by the pandemic, would you vote in favor of another $1,200 federal stimulus check? Your whole time question, and you're right. Uh, I mean, look, this has been incredibly devastating for our economy. In a matter of a few weeks, we literally took a globally interconnected, economically dependent world, and we shut it down voluntarily. We had to do that. I think at the time, we recognized that was an incre incredibly essential and a, and a necessary step. But now you've got to recognize that you've got to deal with the economic impacts of that. And you've got to focus on getting people back to work. In a matter of a few weeks, we cast millions of Americans out of work. More than 27 million Americans lost their job. And you've indicated the uh, high unemployment rate in, in the rural part of our district, which by the way, is, are some of those that have the least capability to develop the economic opportunities. So the truth is, is that I would. I think we need to have additional stimulus. It needs to focus on small businesses. It needs to focus on schools. It needs to focus on additional help for those, and particularly in those areas that have been the hardest hit for that, which is in my district, the rural parts of the district. Thank you. Mr. Weston, one minute. Same question on stimulus. Thank you for the, for the good question. Mr. Stewart voted against the last round of relief, which was a Democrat plan to help the people of America. It is being held up in the Senate by Mr. McConnell, who's more focused on the Supreme Court than on your jobs and my jobs. I got the $1,200 payment because honestly, I'm a teacher and a writer and I'm not making very much money. Um, so I know what the pain is and what I, what I often think about are the people in Utah who are one or two checks away from being thrown out of their apartments. There's a lot of people in that category. I think of the people who never asked me for a yard sign because guess what? They don't have a yard because they don't have a home. We are very close to having, I think, some serious economic repercussions even beyond what we've already got if this relief is, is held up uh, by politics. I don't think we hire people to go to Congress then to tell us why they can't get something done. That's excuse making, that's blaming, it's not delivering for people. And that's, I think, a fundamental failure and we need to get more, more help soon. Mr. Latham, 
One, one minute for you. Sure. And, and uh, as much as I uh, appreciate and empathize with the concern, that approach is kicking the can down the road. I mean, Mr. Stewart's anti-socialism caucus in Congress must be twisting itself in knots trying to justify the next stimulus package. Look, we've proven that our system works very well for candidates who buy our votes with our own money. Uh, if you recall uh, H.L. Mencken, he called every election a sort of advanced auction sale of stolen goods. Only now, with a $27 trillion and climbing national debt, what's now being stolen is our children's future quality of life. Now, the incumbent will say when he first ran for Congress that he's always expressed concern about the debt, which was $16 trillion back in 2013. Um, it seems like uh, the concern is that we still order up another round of the hair of the dog, and the problem is if we do that, once the party's over, the hangover be begins. He wants to avoid that. Um, the more rounds we order up, the, the worse the hangover. Um, I think we need to have a day of reckoning and, and, and uh, again, not kick the can down the road any further. Rebuttal, Mr. Stewart. Oh, yeah, and this Mr. Latham and I agree. I mean, at some point, you've got to pay the debt, and we're going to have something more than a $5 trillion deficit this year. And to, to Kale, look, Kale, you can't have it both ways. You can't politicize everything about this. You said the White House was super spreader events. You never said a word about the uh, hundreds and hundreds of demonstrations that take place every night. Are they not super spreader events as well? You've got to be willing to criticize both. And you said that I don't care about people with the COVID because I wouldn't support this uh, additional stimulus. That was a wish list. It was tax cuts for the rich. It was bailout states that we, people in Utah shouldn't have to go spend our money to bail out California and Massachusetts pension funds. And it was actually cutting police funding. Those are the reasons I didn't support that, not because I didn't care about people with COVID. Time's up, thank you. A uh, 30 second rebuttal for you, Mr. Weston. You know, in 1929, right before the Great Depression, income inequality was like this. In February of 2020, income inequality was just a little bit less than that. There was a $1.5 to $2 trillion tax cut that was passed year one of the Trump administration. If our priorities are people and the public health and the common good, we should find the money to meet those public needs, not find reasons not to help people. It's a clear difference between me and both of these gentlemen. Latham, Mr. Latham, sure. Seconds. Um, didn't know it would come to me, but I mean, again, I, I sympathize with the concern, but I just feel um, if I'm elected to Congress, it's not my money to give. I can't go up there and, and be the candy man um, and, and just give everybody what they want. And I really think, again, we exacerbate the problem by continue to spend ourselves into oblivion. Uh, I think the budget director of the Congressional Budget Office uh, reported Congress just a couple months ago that this path is unsustainable. Unsustainable means we can't keep doing this. And, and so we need to stop. And you know, the sooner we stop, as I sometimes tell my clients in criminal cases, and we, we stop digging the hole, the sooner we can get ourselves out of that hole. So there's gonna be some pain involved, but, but we need to stop what we're doing. Thank you. Moving on to climate and environment, Mr. Weston, for one minute. Recently, more than 120 Utah business, healthcare, faith, education, and government leaders signed the Utah Climate and Clean Air Compact. The compact calls upon state leaders, including members of Congress, to make a commitment and act on finding solutions to the negative effects of climate change and air pollution. Did you or would you sign the Utah Climate and Clean Air Compact? I have not yet, but I would. But let me tell you why I love CD2 as a district. It's got water issues, it's got land issues, it's got huge pollution issues, both in Salt Lake as well as Washington County. So the question is, what do we do about it? When I look at Beaver County, where my parents grew up, my grandparents owned a little furniture store there. There were pig farms and now there's solar and wind. That's the model we need. Let's look internationally. When Mercedes and Volkswagen violated U.S. clean air laws by putting a little widget in their vehicles, they got caught. Now they're paying a huge fine for that. That's what the federal government, what we in Congress need to do. Pub the public good with, with clean air and the environment is something that no state on its own can handle. Locally, I also think we can incentivize through tax incentives good behavior. But there are good models inside the district that we ought to, we ought to pursue. Mr. Latham, would you sign the compact? I, I want to read anything that, that I sign, and since I haven't the text in front of me, um, I, I would want to study that more. But look, on just the basic principle, no government, industry, or corporation has the right to pollute neither the lungs of children downwind, nor the soil or the water of the farmer downstream. In the same way, industrial and governmental pollution should not be permitted to encroach on neighboring property without accountability. 
Uh, right now, not only are the Republicans passing out subsidies and exemptions for polluters like candy, they're maintaining protectionist policies, keeping market solutions like hemp um, from competing. Government should not be in the business of picking winners and losers. If elected, I'll work to remove all barriers to competition and fight to end subsidies and protections for polluters. Not only are we passing along massive debts to our children, we're laminating their oceans in plastic. We can be and we must be better stewards of the earth. The value and virtue of clean air oceans, by the way, is gathering support. There are some impressive ocean technologies uh, and cleanup technologies that are being developed and implemented to do that. Thank you. Mr. Stewart, the same question on climate and environment. Uh, I will look at it, and if I agree with it, and if I think it's going to help and not cost $93 trillion like the Green New Deal and not going to implement and compulsion and not going to force and disrupt the market, then of course I, I would support that. Look, climate change is something we all have to deal with. There's a p reason we live in Utah. We love it here. There's a reason that we want to protect it, because we want to have our children have the same experience that we've had. And so these are some of the things that I've done. Um, we helped the University of Utah get a 500, what will ultimately be a $500 million grant to develop what will be one of the world's premier geothermal research and production facilities, again, anywhere in the world. Uh, I led legislation that would tear down the red tape to stop uh, and make it so difficult to build windmills and solar uh, facilities on federal lands. I think that's an important alternative. At the same time, I recognize that while we want to support alternative forces, forms of energy, we're just not really ready there yet. And you can't decarbonize the, the entire economy in a matter of a few years. There's a transition time. Let's support that. Again, I'm kind of an all of the above guy when it comes to energy. I want to follow up and then we'll get to all of them. <clears throat> For one minute, what would you do in Congress to advance climate and clean air? Um, I mean, on, so, on some level, we have to acknowledge that the federal government is one of the, the major polluters. Um, and, and China, of course, is a major polluter as well. Um, I think just that recognition, rather than, than focus on, on industry, um, will help us move toward the solution. Here's what we don't need to do. We don't need to create a federal heat agency. Um, this concept called regulatory capture, um, where the industry trying to be regulated actually captures the regulating agency. Some say the Securities and Exchange Commission has been captured by Wall Street to the disadvantage of Main Street. Um, once a government agency gets captured or controlled uh, by the bad actors it's supposed to control, then, then it's a problem. And with regard to extreme heat, uh, some are really proposing this federal heat agency. I'm not making this up. I wish I was. If the success of the war on poverty, the war on drugs, and the 19-year war in Afghanistan give us any indication can you imagine how hot it's going to get once a war on heat is declared? Mr. Stewart, same question. What have you done on climate and yeah. air quality? Well, I actually answered that question in my previous response. I talked about uh, the red tape, making it more, uh, make it easier for there to be these alternative forces of, or sources of energy produced on public lands, uh, geothermal and others. Um, I think at the end of the day, we need to realize this. There are some ideas out there that are actually bad ideas. The Green New Deal is an incredibly bad idea, $93 trillion, and it uses force and compulsion uh, in ways that I just think the American people would never accept. Uh, you also have to recognize that the federal government can't fix this problem. Salt Lake City is a unique city in the sense that we don't produce any more uh, pollutants than, say, Portland or other cities our size. But we have this geological uh, reality that the mountains trap that in and make it more, uh, more obvious during the winter months. A, a lot of those answers are going to come from local leaders. They're going to come from governors. They're going to come from business leaders. A federal mandate would treat Portland the same as Utah. And Salt Lake City probably needs to have even more stringent standards in some of these cities because we have uh, unique circumstances here. Specifically, Mr. Weston, what would you do? There would be a couple levels I'd start with, but I, I should point out that I believe I, our campaign has accepted no PAC money, so we've not taken any money from any fossil fuel or, or gas and oil interest. My opponent to my right over eight years has, I believe, taken about $300,000. That's, that's a big difference. I would start at the international level, the Paris Agreement. We need to get back into the international discussions. Right now, Trump has pulled us out. We're acting like we don't need to be part of those discussions. That's wrong. Climate is not just an American challenge, it's a global challenge. More locally, I would cite one example of Mayor Mendenhall here in Salt Lake City that I like. She's incentivized use of public transportation. 
if people have got to go to somewhere, why don't we have vouchers or something that can improve that? One thing I think Congress could do is look at how we build our communities and if there are federal dollars that can come in to make that greener through tax incentives, we ought to do it. But if companies and, and people aren't doing it, I'm not beyond saying like we did to Volkswagen, you're going to pay a penalty. 30 seconds, well, rebuttal. I mean, my opponent uh, seems to have a little opinion of me. I didn't realize that till tonight. But it's look, just a fair one. You are, uh, you're indicating that because I had some PACs who represent energy companies, that's, that's a bad thing. Did they do that so that I would facilitate green energy, like I've mentioned, geothermal, make it easier to develop wind, make it easier to develop solar? If that's the reason they contributed to me, they must be very disappointed. It's very clear that I'm willing to engage in all of these. Geo, solar, wind, carbon. I think the American people need all of these sources of energy, and, and I'll try to help all of those industries and try to help them equally. 30 seconds, Mr. Latham. Well, I was almost going to just say, let's take the next question. But um, let, let's be mindful that the Utah legislature uh, engaged in a form of corporate welfare um, you might even call it crony capitalism, when they allocated this money uh, to build, I guess, a, a depot in, in Oakland, California, uh, to get coal you know, to, to and from, but basically from central Utah. Um, that, that, again, that's that kind of picking winners and losers that's per potentially polluting our planet. That's the kind of thing that I would not be supporting if elected. Just Rebuttal. one final follow-up. You know, I, I teach Marines. I'm a working candidate. That's how I pay my bills. And if, if, if I could encourage all of us to just go to fec.gov, Google my name, Google Mr. Stewart's name, I believe, Mr. Latham, you have not filed, and, and find out who's giving us money and how we're spending money. And that's fair. You can, you can read all you want about the differences between me and Mr. Stewart. You'll find how many PACs donate to him and how we have taken no PAC money. I'm not assuming anything about you. I'm just saying that people ought to have access to that information. So you're not assuming anything about me. You're just hoping other people will assume something about me. Well, it's public record. They ought to, they ought to look into it. Okay, and, thank you. And, and uh, Pat, if I may respond, since I, just, just I, I did want to take this idea that I haven't filed like I should file. Um, I'm an attorney. I know the law on, on First Amendment and, and elections. So because my activity is less than $5,000, both receiving money and spending money, I'm not even recognized as a candidate under federal law. And I think that's a good thing, right? We don't want to have candidates who don't engage in that kind of activity um, have to, you know, fill out some paperwork so a bureaucrat can hug it. Um, That's fair. Thank you, Mr. Latham. Uh, we're nearing the midpoint of our time tonight. I welcome you once again to this live debate between candidates for Utah's 2nd Congressional District. We are broadcasting live from downtown Salt Lake City. Now back to our exchange. We have a, an important question on health care, which I'm sure is a, a nice segue. Uh, Mr. Stewart, this one goes to you for 90 seconds. Access to quality, affordable health care continues to be a major concern, and there are efforts to overturn the Affordable Care Act. Would you vote to repeal the Affordable Care Act, yes or no? Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's a fact because I've done it many times. But in every case, I also, it was not just repeal, it was repeal and replace. In every single case, I had a plan, the Republicans had a plan that would, for example, protect those with pre-existing conditions. Every single time. For the media, which is frankly just lazy on this, and for our Democratic opponents who just aren't being honest to say we want to not protect people with pre-existing conditions, it is simply not true. Our plan did, we gave block grants to the states and, and to facilitate uh, buying coverage for them. It also protected uh, children to stay on their parents' plans up to age 26, which was, was, by the way, a Republican proposal. After that, you have to do things to drive down costs. Look, I'm on Obamacare. A lot of people don't realize that. One of the provisions of it was that those of us in Congress have to be under Obamacare. I know how bad it is. I know how expensive it is. I deal with that every month. If you're going to help more people be insured, and by the way, it being the law of the land, if you're unhappy with the number of people that are insured or that are uninsured and the cost, you have to recognize that's a failure of Obamacare. Drive down the cost. Medicare Part D was a great example of how we do that. Tort reform. Being able to purchase across state lines. I had a very uh, a personal example of that. I moved a few miles, happened to cross the state line. Insurance was available to me in this state, wasn't available to me here. There are things that we could do to drive down the cost, make it more affordable for people. But again, don't ever listen to someone who says Republicans were tried not protect pre-existing conditions. It's simply not true. 
Mr. Weston, 90 seconds for you, same question. Well, again, I, I think a majority of Utahns would trade their health care for what a member of Congress has. Well, they, they can do that any time. They can always go on Obamacare. It's not the same. I'm on the individual market, which is Obamacare. It is exactly the same. My health care is Obamacare. If, if it's I could, available yeah. to anyone. If, if you just let me yes, finish, then we can have finish. a conversation. Uh, I, I respectfully disagree. Uh, millions of Americans do not have the quality of care that a member of Congress has. The people that are hurting most in our district are afraid of going bankrupt if they don't have Obamacare. One week after election, the Supreme Court is going to take up this case. If the Supreme Court gets rid of Obamacare, which I'm on, which is very different than what a member of Congress is on, fundamentally, <laughs> you may go bankrupt. We as a party are the only ones who have a long track record of fighting for more health care, not trying to take it away. Again, I think we all need to do our homework and look at the 40 plus times Mr. Stewart has voted to take away the Affordable Care Act. What shifted is the politics. The Affordable Care Act became popular, and suddenly when it became popular, kids with pre-existing conditions, cancer, the Republicans suddenly panicked, and they said, oops, we need to pretend like we're for pre-existing conditions. The track record is there, the voting record is there, his health insurance, this running for office should not be about what you have. It should be about what's missing from the American people, and that's why I'm running. If you vote for me, I will be the wall between them and them taking your health insurance. Thank you. Mr. Latham, 90 seconds. Sure. Uh, a common mis mischaracterization or misperception of those who favor a free market in any service is that we want to take that service away. The exact opposite is true. I don't want to overthrow government. I want to overgrow the government. And when it comes to health care, I don't want a limited selection of choices. I want a wide range of choices. I don't want the shortages and rationing that comes with any socialized service. I want to liberate health care from the politicians and the bureaucrats. I want to remove state-created, sometimes industry-supported, obstacles in the medical services market so there can be plans by the many, not by the few. I want competition among those plans. Where we have competition in medical procedures like LASIK and cosmetic surgery, prices are relatively affordable compared to procedures covered by insurance. By the way, insurance is probably not the right word to use when it comes to most health care plans. Just think how expensive your car insurance would be if it also covered gas, oil changes, and car washes. We should have the ability as consumers to purchase catastrophic health care plans for emergencies when price negotiation is not practical, but let the free market operate for every other service. You know, when I hear government health care for all, I think the VA hospital for all. Check out the scorecards for the VA hospitals. If you're concerned about how qualified immunity for law enforcement officers works, Consider how an unaccountable culture would play out in a hospital setting. 30 second rebuttal, Mr. Stewart. Yeah, I just got to come back to clarify because there are some things that are just demonstrably true. And uh, Kale, you said you respectfully disagree. I appreciate that, but it doesn't make you right. And I'm surprised you don't know this. I, as a member of Congress, am on Obamacare. It was one of the original provisions that said that we would be on Obamacare. It's just your package and is very different than most My Americans. package is available just like anyone else's. I choose from the same menu that everyone else. There's no special package for Congress members. And the other thing is, again, if they tell you that Republicans wanted to take away pre-existing conditions, challenge them. Say, show me the bill, show me the language, because it's simply not true. We have never voted to take away protections for pre-existing conditions. We wanted to strengthen them. Okay, Mr. You know, Weston. I'm glad we're spending a lot of time on health care because, again, if there's one issue that I will fight for you and your families, it's for your, for your health care and your right not to go bankrupt. I was in Mr. Stewart's hometown in Farmington, and a voter there, she said, because of a, of a prior bill, uh, she could only get health care if she pays in cash. I was in Richfield where a gentleman said because of a psychiatric emergency with his wife, he did not have access to the care that he could get here in Salt Lake City. These are real lives, these are real issues, and with all due respect, a member of Congress is not sweating the same way every Utah is on this issue. Mr. Latham, would you like to rebut? I, uh, no, we can go to the next okay, question. Okay, thank you. We do have a live in studio uh, with a question. Is Lad Egan of KSL. Thank you, and good evening, gentlemen. Representative Stewart, you've reintroduced legislation to create a sixth national park in Utah. The proposed Escalante Canyons National Park would fall within the boundaries of the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. It would also create a local management council. My question is, uh, Congressman Stewart, why did you revive this legislation? And for Mr. Weston and Mr. Latham, would you take such action if elected? 
Well, Mr. Latham, I'm going to start with you first since it's your time. Uh, well, let's go to you first and ask if you would take such action if you were in Congress. I, the short answer is no. Um, I, you know, the state of Utah actually, member stepped in and managed some national parks uh, during the time when the federal government, I guess, was, was struggling with its finances. So I don't see why we in Utah can't manage our own lands uh, just as well, if not better, than the federal government. So I, I, I would prefer um, a solution that's more locally based rather than managed by folks back in Washington, D.C. Mr. Stewart. Well, in the fact, again, Mr. Latham, you and I agree, that was one of the beauties of this piece of legislation because it did uh, maintain a lot of control over this, it, th this national park through, through local community, through local leadership. Uh, look, the reason I did it is because I felt like this particular piece of pro uh, land was so beautiful that it deserved the protections of a national park. All of us are so proud of Utah. I mean, there's a, again, there's a reason that we live here. There's a reason why we hope our kids can have an economic future where they can live here as well. There are some parts of Utah that are so spectacular, they truly deserve the National Park designation. But in doing that, we wanted to do it in a slightly different way, in what we think is a, a meaningfully better way. And that is you don't take the land and designate it as a park and now turn it over to Washington, D.C. and say, you guys management. Let's, let's have shared management of it. Let's have the community share in that management. Let's have the state share in that management. And I think this is a, this is a beautiful piece of legislation that is a, a great compromise of those interests. And by the way, it's interesting to me to listen to what you know activist groups and environmental groups, they got to twist themselves in pretzels to oppose this. I honestly don't understand why they don't, why they don't support it because uh, we want to protect this land. It's a way to do it in a, in a way that allows for some state and local input. Why would someone oppose that? I just don't really understand that. Thank you. Again, on public lands, Mr. Weston, 90 seconds. There are several good reasons why people are opposing this, and there's a reason why it's not going to go anywhere. It didn't go anywhere around one, and it, it won't go anywhere around two. It's a bad idea, and it's unwise policy. I've sat in Garfield County Commission meetings twice. This is the county where Ground Staircase is located. I'm the nephew of a county commissioner who was a longtime Democratic county commissioner in Beaver County. These national lands cannot be handed over to county commissioners. Nothing against county commissioners per se, but these are national assets. These are for all Americans, whether someone's in Maine or California. What the plan actually does is rework boundaries so that some of the protections which you cite will not be there for the land that would have been in the original boundaries. So if, if Vice President Biden soon becomes President Biden, he will, I believe, extend the monument's boundaries back to their original locations. I support that. He will make sure that voices are at the table, but that these protections will, will not be negotiated away to certain industries that probably have a different motivation than people like me who camp and hike and occasionally ride my mountain bike on these areas. So this is a, this is a clear difference between us. I think it's wrapped up in language that, that is politicized from one side, and I think we need to always think about protecting these lands and not overexposing them. The, the biggest crime right now is the underfunding of our park system. So he's putting forward another park without supporting and having Congress pay for what our current parks demand in terms of good services. Public lands, uh, Mr. Latham? And, and just maybe to extend on, on my earlier answer, I mean, it comes back to who's gonna do a better job of, of protecting this land. Um, you know, private property rights are a way of protecting human values. So if you want something to happen on uh, your land, uh, then you can exclude those who are doing things on your land that, that you don't support. And that goes for uh, natural environments as well. We're all familiar, I hope, with the Nature Conservancy, which goes out and acquires uh, you know, scenic uh, lands, and then they put a conservation easement on them. And then what's nice about that is it's no longer a political football, but it's privately owned and protected. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stewart, a 30-second rebuttal. Yes, I'll tell you this very briefly again, just to clarify the record. In fact, I have supported and have worked for years to, for additional funding for public parks and maintenance. It's something we've worked care, uh, carefully on and aggressively. And the second thing, and this is the whole point of this, the presumption of many is that the people in Utah are just too stupid or too ill-willed to manage their own lands. You need to turn it over to some bureaucrat in Washington, D.C., who, by the way, may never come to Utah and trust him, but we can't do it ourselves. I think most people in Utah reject that. We are perfectly capable of protecting these lands. We want to protect these lands.
Mr. Weston, 30 you know, seconds. As the son of a downwinder, and I'm, I'm proudly half redneck. My parents grew up in rural Utah. I had an uncle who was a county commissioner. Uh, I believe federal government has a legitimate role when it comes to federal land and national assets. In no way is that demeaning to the local population. That's half my family. So on this issue, I believe it's a clear difference between me and Mr. Stewart. I think he wants to throw these lines out there to appeal to maybe rural folks. Well, I'm, I'm pretty much rural with my background once removed. So I understand what that conversation needs to be. And I think working together, we'll get to a better place where all of these lands are protected. Thank you. We next have a video from an SUU student, Royce Godore. This goes to uh, Mr. Stewart, one minute. Hi, my name is Royce Godore, and I'm a student at Southern Utah University. Rural Utahns depend on the United States Postal Service to receive prescription medicine, paychecks, and send their ballot. The closure of the Tory Post Office is one example of the great burden placed on rural Utahns when they are not able to send and receive mail locally. Will you fund and support rural post offices that are currently struggling to stay open? Yeah, look, this won't take a full minute. I have, as a member of the Appropriations Committee, one of the most powerful committees in Congress, I have fought for funding for the Postal Service the entire time. You, you don't know the effort we've t we put in to keep that post office open in Torrey, as well as several other small communities, working intensely for months and months with the local community to try to find an alternative. Uh, again, this is an easy one. I represent some of the remote, some of the most remote parts of the lower 48. I have counties with a few thousand people that people would drive an hour or longer to go to a post office if, if they lose their local post office. Uh, it's one of the responsibilities of federal government to provide basic postal service, and, we, and I always have supported that, and I will continue to support that. It's just too important to this district not to have me take that responsibility. Mr. Weston, one minute. Well, then I would just ask a question for all of us to consider the last time the U.S. Postal Service funding was up for a vote. Mr. Stewart didn't vote against it. He didn't vote for it. He didn't show up for the vote, and I don't know why. Um, I've spent, uh, in the last four months, about 6,000 miles in a 17-year-old truck with our tech director, who's a former Marine, who's helped out a lot with our drone. When we stop in these little towns, we take photos. We've taken over 32, 34 photos of little post offices all across rural Utah. We started to do that in May. Why we did that is we know that during COVID, when communities are not affected equally. If you're a minority community, you're gonna be hit harder. If you're a rural community, you're gonna be worried about where you get your mail. Um, we've been fighting on this issue for a long time and we've put radio ads out on Sean Hannity because we believe people in rural Utah understand that I'm for the post office and I've been putting tire tread where my mouth is. And that's a big difference, I think, between us and maybe avoiding a vote that was very important. Mr. Latham, one minute for you. Sure, and I'm probably gonna channel my, my inner Ron Paul here and be Dr. No and, and say that we need to separate state and postal delivery. Um, look, the DNRs, uh, rather than think outside of the box, just want us to have a bigger box. Now, we believe it or not, you would think the post office would not normally be a political issue, and yet in this election, uh, we're now hearing news that the Postal Service is somehow um, perhaps going to interfere with the outcome of the election. And, and as it turns out, this is not a new thing. All the way back to when the Anti-Federalists and the Federalists um, were the two dueling political parties, the Post Office was involved back then in slow walking uh, ma mail um, and, and to affect the outcome of an election. So let's depoliticize. Um, the post office, we have FedEx, we have UPS. Um, let's bring not only the troops home from overseas, but the drones home. And perhaps if the drones can drop uh, precision weaponry overseas, they can drop insulin uh, to rural Utahns. We want to go to the next question from Ben Winslow, Fox 13, live here in studio. Well, gentlemen, if you get to Congress, you're going to have to reach across the aisle and work with members of the opposite party. So I want to know what specific policies do you like from the opposing party? Mr. Weston, one minute on that question. Well, I, I led off with this campaign by saying I do not believe one party has all the answers. The logo of our campaign is not a handshake, it's four arms together. The division in our country, we need to close this chapter. I do not believe this chapter will be closed if Donald Trump is reelected or the people who are so loyal to him like Mr. Stewart. We need to move on to a better place. What would I do specifically? I think I would start on foreign policy and national security. I would make sure that we don't talk about leaving NATO. That used to be a bipartisan 
fully agreed position. Donald Trump seems to be playing loose with the idea that he may pull us out of NATO, and Mr. Stewart has been quiet on that issue. But the on question is, what specifically do you like from the opposing party? Well, you've got good people in both parties. I mean, I, I think there are people in the Republican Party that are actually looking to solve problems. And so that, I would say, is, is positive. I think you have a party that for a long time on rights was very vocal. They've lost that, I think, recently. That would be another example. Sure. And Ben, your, your question is kind of a fun one because so because we now have a sitting libertarian member of Congress, Justin Amash from Michigan, uh, we now have an example, a real world example of what it would look like to have uh, a libertarian sitting in Congress. And what Representative Amash has done is been a co-sponsor of what's called the, um, uh, the End Qualified Immunity Act. Um, th this is legislation that would uh, remove the judicially created doctrine. It wasn't a, a federally or a statutorily created doctrine that uh, protects police officers from, from accountability when they've abused their authority. And, and so I would certainly be a co-sponsor uh, and a supporter of the End uh, Qualified Immunity Act. It's a tripartisan uh, sponsored bill because it's not only uh, sponsored by Representative Amash, it's represented by a Republican and then several Democrats as well. Uh, I'm aware that there is the Fair Representation Act, which is uh, sponsored by many uh, Democratic members of Congress, and that would bring multi-member districts to Utah, which I, I love, and that would, make our, we would, that would end gerrymandering in Utah. One minute, Mr. Stewart. It's a great question. I want to answer it. I got to go back really quickly. I didn't want to ask for 30 seconds. I can do this faster than that. The reason I missed that vote is because I had a member of my family who was leaving on an LDS mission. That's a big deal. Sometimes you got to support your family. And by the way, I have one of the highest voting records as far as attendance in the entire Congress. I think it's higher than anyone else in Utah. It wasn't like I was just sleeping in or decided not to go. The question is, what do we do, or what do we think of in the other opposing party that we can work together that I respect? One of them is I respect their sense of fairness, which is why we have developed a coalition of Republicans and Democrats, some of the largest LD, LGBTQ activists in the country, religious leaders, to do a model after the Utah Compromise to protect religious liberty and also to protect against discrimination. I respect that they want to protect the environment, which is why we were able to build a coalition, Republicans and Democrats, to protect the wild horse and burrow population, but also to protect the rangeland, uh, to protect the natural environment around it. 988, another bipartisan effort that we had, took Republicans and Democrats, people who care about helping veterans and youth in a mental health crisis. Those are the things that we have in common. Those are the things that we can work on together, and, and I've got evidence of that there. Thank you. The final question tonight comes from Glenn Mills of ABC4 Utah. We'll go to Mr. Latham for one minute. Thank you, Pat. Good to see you. Gentlemen, as it often does, the Supreme Court has become a key issue this election season. If a proposal were to make it to the House to alter the number of justices from the current nine, how would you vote on that and why? And, and if I may just say, so I was a law clerk during law school on the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee's minority staff. Uh, Senator Orrin Hatch uh, uh, invited me to come back there to Washington, D.C. that summer, um, and we vetted then uh, ju Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who then, of course, became Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So it's been interesting to reflect uh, on her passing um, these, these past few weeks. Uh, as a practicing lawyer, I am troubled by the idea of adding more judges, justices, to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, so right now, I don't see myself supporting uh, packing the court. Thank you. Mr. Stewart, one minute. Well, not only am I troubled by it, I think it's absurd. I think it's one of the most ridiculous and divisive and destructive ideas that have ever been suggested. And it's one of those things that used to be kind of a fringe, far left, you know, kind of wacko idea that now has become mainstream. If you want to destroy the integrity of the court, then pack it. Then come back and say, hey, it doesn't matter if the, if the Republicans, they didn't do anything illegal. It's clearly nothing unconstitutional. But we're going to change it now. And we're going to make 13 or 15. And then what happens with the next Republican administration? Are they going to make it 18 or 20? And how many years will it be till you have as many members on the Supreme Court as you have members of Congress? You destroy the integrity of the Supreme Court. I think even suggesting it is nuts. And I think every Democrat has a responsibility to stand up and say, I agree, it's a bad idea, I wouldn't support it, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm 
shocked that Vice President Biden won't at least tell us what his views are, because the American people aren't stupid. They know how destructive this would be if you say, we're just going to change the number. We didn't get the outcome we wanted by winning elections, so we're going to get the outcome we want Thank by you. changing the court. Thank you. Mr. Weston, well, one minute. What, what shocks me is 220,000 dead Americans and 8 million Americans infected with a virus. And if we had been told the truth, that number would be a lot lower. To your question, um, we need, I believe, to trust the people. This would not be an issue if this election could move forward and the will of the American people would be respected. That's not what uh, Mitch McConnell's going to do. He's going to use raw power and raw politics probably to vote on this uh, justice's nomination, and she'll probably get those votes. My preference is let the will of the American people, where we've got record turnout, it looks like, and we should, we should defer to the American people. But again, what shocks me isn't inside baseball in Washington. It's dead Americans. It's Americans getting infected because a president of the United States will not wear a mask, says he's cured says that we should drink Lysol. If you're a senior or a working mom, those are the issues I want to talk about. Thank so thank you. Thank you. No time for rebuttal. Uh, we've reached the end of our allotted time for questions for the candidates, and we'll now move to one minute closing statements. Prior to airtime, it was determined Mr. Weston would have the first one minute opportunity. Mr. Weston. Thank you, Pat, and everyone who made this possible, all the camera folks in our media. This election is a real choice. This is not a difference of 10%. This is a 100% difference here tonight. Our country is tired. Our people are hurting. Our politics are failing you, failing our people, particularly the most vulnerable among us. A better future, I believe, is possible in January, and it should be not based on the politics of fear and division, which is what we've experienced for the last four years. But it's going to take all of us to do that. I'm diplomatic by nature. I'm a bridge builder by nature. In my former job, I used to have to bring former Taliban fighters to the table in the State Department role that I had so that they wouldn't shoot and kill our troops. I never thought that experience would be as important as it is now. But I'll leave with referencing a great Republican president. Abraham Lincoln said we need to find the better angels in our nature. That's what I'm about. That's what I believe we need to do with each other. And if we can do that, I do think January is going to be a better place where we can be a United States of America, not a disunited States of America. Thank you, and I ask for your vote. Thank you. Next, Mr. Latham, one minute. Sure. Uh, and thank you again, Pat, and thank you to the Utah Debate Commission for having me here. Um, that summer when I was in Washington, D.C., I'd walk by a poster on a utility box that said, government is a protection racket. It rings true when it seems every election season the duopoly and its institutional enablers say that if you don't vote for getting beat with the right fist, you'll get beat with the left fist. So rather than have a day of reckoning with the national debt, those with power and privilege attempt to buy our obedience by increasing the limits on the federal credit card. And the future of our nation's children continues to suffer. Many would just as soon forget this and prefer to offer two more years of tribute to the DNR's Hunger Games. If that's you, well, may the odds be ever in your favor. But if you see the two-faced tyranny I see, if you feel the political control gimmicks, cruelty, and injustice I feel, if instead you seek a world set free in our lifetime, then raise your voice, break the bipartisan cycle of abuse, vote libertarian, Thanks. and let's give them a November 3rd that shall never, ever be forgot. Thank you, Mr. Uh, and our final one minute opportunity to Congressman Chris Stewart. Again, thank you, Pat, to the commission, to my opponents. Look, I know it's hard to run and I appreciate them being willing to do this. And uh, Mr. West and I, we actually have something we, we agreed on finally, and that is you're right. This is an incredibly important election. I view it as we are climbing this mountain to that shining city on the hill, but it is a hard climb and it's a difficult climb to get there. Here's our choice. Keep climbing up that mountain or take a hard left turn and literally walk off the cliff. Conservative policies are the only thing that can save the American dream. Conservative policies are the only thing that can save a future that our children can be proud of and give the opportunities that we were given. Climb up that mountain or turn and walk off the cliff. To those of you who wonder, we are going to keep climbing. We are going to keep aspiring. We will keep fighting. The American people are going to win. God bless you all. God bless, as always, the United States of America.
Our thanks to Robert Latham, Chris Stewart, and Cale Weston for their time this evening. It's been an informative hour. The Commission thanks our generous sponsors, the Larry H. and Gail Miller Family Foundation, the George S. and Dolores Dory Eccles Foundation, and doTERRA. Special appreciation goes to Utah Debate Commission co-chairs Karen Hale, Wayne Niederhauser, and Executive Director Nina Sliding. And particular thanks to the many broadcast stations who brought you this debate as a public service. You've heard from the candidates. The Utah Debate Commission urges you to learn more about these candidates and where they stand on the issues important to you. Then vote in the upcoming election. Remember, mail-in ballots must be postmarked by November 2nd. From Salt Lake City, I'm Pat Jones. Thank you, everyone. Is the audio okay? Oh, yeah, it okay. sounded great. Right. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Glenn. Go ahead, yourself. Hey, I can't afford a new one, and it doesn't have a lot of gadgets, which means the battery won't die like my friend John's vehicle. At this point, no. Is it a bad idea or a failure from the top of the Democratic ticket to refuse to answer that question? Yeah, I think Vice President Biden has said he will answer that question before election, and I think that's important that he do that. But millions of people are voting yes. Voting Correct. I would, I would handle the issue differently. I'm not running for president, but I believe, to my point, what's important is, is that I trust the people, and I would have rather had an important issue like this be adjudicated literally through the vote on November 3rd. So if you stand against that, how would you fight what would likely mostly be coming from your party? Well, I'm not saying 
I'm against it. At this point, I don't think it's a wise approach because I would rather talk about COVID. I'd rather talk about healthcare. I'd rather have us focus on issues that I believe should unite us, which is how to make sure more Americans don't die who don't need to die. So what are the, the lasting threats here to Kim Pierce Regents to try to you know, persuade voters in a very Republican district to consider a Democrat? Well, at 6.15, I'll be on the road to Richfield for the fourth time. Do I think I'm going to turn Richfield on November 3rd? Probably not, but I've been there four times, and I'm on a live radio program, and they invited me. I've been out to Tooele three times for the Libertarian podcast. They brew their own beer, and we talk politics. Um, so I'm not, I've never wanted to run a campaign that says, woe is me as a Democrat. Oh, my gosh, these boundaries, we're never going to win. Because I believe on issues, there are bridging issues. If I guess, get asked about guns in rural Utah, I grew up with guns. I was a deer hunter. And then I want to move to issues like health care, like the disunity in our country. So I'll be on the road for the next four days. We'll start in Richfield. We'll go through Escalante, Boulder. We'll be in St. George. For the debate night, to your point, I'm trying to find a secret cave that I can actually watch the, the presidential debate and not let my campaign know where I am. Um, but we're working very hard up through the very end. I just dropped off my own ballot on Sunday at the, at the county building. But again, I, I'm, I'm in this to, to build our party. I think Utah uh, used to be a healthy two-party state. That's good for everyone. It's even good for Republicans. So that's why I love this district, not only because of the family story, but because I believe as a Democrat, I wanna be in a room where people disagree with me. I wanna be in red Utah. It's half my family. I've got a cousin who does alfalfa fields outside Beaver. You know, so, so as a candidate and as someone who represented our country, I'm fundamentally concerned about how divided we are. I think it's very dangerous. What the war zones taught me is once civil unrest gets out of control, it's very hard to slow it down. And those are the experience that, experiences I think I bring to the, to the job. Anybody have a Zoom question? Zoom. Stewart was on the same plan as, as rank and file Americans, but, be, but beyond that, what would you propose to improve the Affordable Care Act? It's a good question. So I'm on the individual market. Select Health sends me a letter every September and says I've got 10 days to decide. I can guarantee you he's, he's not in that category. Um, what would I do? I think there are issues about bringing prescription drug prices down. I think there's a way if we give a public option that would actually improve choice for people. I'm not for taking away private insurance from 60 or 70 million Americans. So I think what you do is you basically look at giving people an option that would be more of a maybe um, basic option, but it would be under the government. I think a lot of people would actually move in that direction. I think there's another point that didn't come up that I wish had, which is I, I, it's good that he got the 988 uh, National Suicide Hotline. I know Seth Moulton, the Democrat who worked with him on that. But to vote 40 times against the ACA, the most important piece of legislation for mental health by far has been the Affordable Care Act. And I wish that that distinction had come up. So there's ways, I think, to look at the cost issue. There's still access issues. There's the Medicaid uh, dimension, which this administration has consistently tried to reduce the amount of money going toward Medicaid. One of the principles I have is um, governing, in my view, is about trying to achieve the public good. And how you get there is an honest, legitimate debate. And every democratic plan isn't perfect. But I do think the biggest advantage of the ACA is it brought in about 23 million Americans into a system, while imperfect, at least gives peace of mind. The caps, the pre-existing condition, all of those things. Thank you. Yep. Any, any questions from Zoom? No foreign policy questions. Well, thank you for your time. Thanks for the good questions.
looking at you. I can. Are we live? Is this hot? I see myself. Kind of shorter, maybe. Okay. So, in the last few weeks of the campaign, what, you know, you got a big platform here on the debate stage by bringing, you know, being able to share a libertarian philosophy with a statewide audience. So, what are you doing to, in the last few weeks of the campaign, to kind of uh, get people to consider maybe a libertarian candidate in what is an overwhelmingly Republican district? Right. Well, uh, we have several events scheduled. We're actually going to do a candidate forum down at Dixie State. Well, I, I take that back. It was planned for in person. They moved it online, but there's something planned, I guess, for Wednesday uh, evening at Dixie State. Um, I'll, I'll be open, basically, to other kinds of meet the candidate events, whether just interacting through social media um, and that kind of thing. Um, there, there's still some time, so I, I'm, I'm open to engaging with voters as much as possible, but uh, my campaign website for utons.com, for utons.org. They both work. Uh, that, that's a place where people can learn more about my, my take on the issues and my positions. Um, and, and so I don't know that there's much more that I can add to that. But some people ask questions, and I'm, I'm happy to engage them as opportunities uh, present themselves. Uh, like Mr. Weston, I'm, I'm also a working candidate, so I do have other obligations going on as well. So I, I am limited in my ability to go out and do the traditional thing. Um, this district, by the way, I think is very liberty-minded. So, uh, I mean, that obviously I think is one of the big reasons I'm here is because people uh, support that and it, they recognize that there's a difference between uh, the Libertarian Party uh, and its platform and the, well, what used to be a platform of the Republican Party. I think they maybe, they've got their commitment with America and the Democratic platform. So, but again, I'll, I'll work with anybody who helps move our, our country uh, in a more liberty-minded direction. Still, though, libertarian ideology is closer to Republican than Democrat, I think most would say. Most would say that, but I, I would take issue with that um, because I think sometimes on certain issues we will outflank. But there, uh, are, there are clearly libertarians in Utah who run for office under the Republican banner. I well, can't uh, think of any who do the opposite. I, I think so you're correct. A question for you. Though. Sure. Um, and, and, well, I think the big one, and it's unfortunate we didn't talk about this uh, tonight, but it's foreign policy. Um, I am very concerned uh, with this uh, China task force that what's going on is uh, the Republican Party in particular uh, is, is beating the drum uh, for a war with China, which, of course, would just be uh, a global disaster. Uh, at, it's, it's said James Madison said that uh, when the political class uh, you know, senses some kind of uh, apprehension among the populace, then they excite a war to distract the masses from that. And, and I worry because, you know, we are in, in somewhat um, uh, troubled waters right now, that that's what's going on to distract us from really solving uh, the problems that, then again, I call it the oligarchy, um, that is uh, exploiting, oppressing um, the rest of us, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, from, from making those changes that can democratize and decentralize uh, power. So, so I, I wish we would have talked more about uh, foreign affairs and military intervention. Uh, I'm, I'm all for uh, um, Americans uh, being defended, but in, in America. So I want us to have a strong military, but be neutral like Switzerland. So armed, but neutral. Uh, back to this idea of the libertarian ideology here in the state of Utah. You mentioned a lot of people in this district have that liberty mindset. I think it is strong across the state of Utah, but the party doesn't necessarily match up with the strength of the ideology. Why do you think libertarians, instead of joining the party and making it stronger, are Republicans or uh, members of other parties? It, it's a great question, and it's another issue I wish we would have talked about tonight. I did have it there in, in my notes, but it's it's our electoral system. Um, and so I, I, I call myself a repu recovering Republican, being born and raised in Utah, and then I discovered libertarianism and, and, and moved that way. If you remember, former state senator Mark Madsen uh, was a Republican and then came over to the Libertarian Party uh, during his last term in office. But the electoral system, so we have this uh, thing called the first-past-the-post plurality system, and generally in countries where uh, that's in play, you have a strong two-party system and then everybody else is marginalized. In most of the world's democracies these days, they have some kind of proportional representation system, uh, multi-member system, and, and the Fair Representation Act would actually help move 
the United States in a more diverse direction. And when you do that, you get more women elected, you get more racial minorities elected. A fun thing that just happened, um, so New Zealand uses proportional representation. So does Ireland, I think, and Australia. And they just had their national elections. The uh, libertarian counterpart over there in New Zealand, they're called the ACT Party. Uh, they received 8% of the vote. So they get 8% of the seats in their 120 member National Assembly. So that's 10 seats. So that means that you know, we don't get a majority, but at least we get some seats at the table and a voice, and we can contribute to the policy discussion. So um, also ranked choice voting is another reason, right? We're, we wanna get rid of the ranked choice system in this. That's why these voting systems will prevent gerrymandering, which has been a problem in Utah. And again, it will prevent that wasted vote argument. Unfortunately, that's why a lot of incumbents don't want that kind of thing because uh, that wasn't the system that helped elect them. Questions from Zoom. Zoom silence. So, what do you hope that viewers took from this tonight about libertarianism? Again, given that it's maybe a lot of people's first exposure uh, to it. I, I hope they realize that it's that it's an option that they ought to consider and that it's making progress. I mean, th those of us uh, who have been involved, uh, the party is uh, started, in the, started in the 1970s. Actually, Utah was one of the early places where the Libertarian Party started. Um, and those of us recognize that it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and, and we're building on, on our progress. And uh, it, it's been encouraging. You know, we didn't also talk about uh, our, our national candidate, Joe Jorgensen. She's on the ballot in all 50 states. She's the first woman to be on the ballot in all 50 states um, in two election cycles. We have the first millennial, uh, Spike Cohen, her running mate, who's on the ballot in all 50 states, the first millennial to be on the ballot in all 50, 50 states. And they're recognizing at their national campaign that most of their volunteers are coming from other parties or independents, and, and we're not libertarians. So I think most people, again, I think the Gallup poll shows that most Americans want a third party. Um, well, guess what? We're the libertarians. We're the nation's third largest party. Uh, check us out. We're on lp.org. You can call the 1-800 number, 1-800-ELECT-US to learn more. Thanks, gentlemen. Good evening. Ah. What was your reaction to Chris Stewart's response that uh, fiddling with the court, the Supreme Court, It, it was a little overdone. I mean, be, be, because, of course, there has been pa court packing schemes in the past. So unfortunately, there, there is historical precedent for doing that. Um, it, it, but it, it bothers me. I mean, I guess I didn't express my concern. Uh, I mean, I just did it. It is what it is. Um, so if, we, if it's there, we, we manage it. But it's, it's not something I want. It's, I, I don't think we need to expand the Supreme Court. And, and, I'm, and I'm troubled, like I think a lot of people are, um, that Joe Biden and his running mate won't take that off the table. Any, Any final, final question, question from Zoom? I guess we're done. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Again. Sure.
Hey everyone, thanks for saying. I'm sure the last thing you want to do is hear more from me. Uh, we'll see if there's any questions. Yeah, question for you, Representative. So I understand a party is going to look at one issue and the other party is going to look at it the way they will, but let's, let's focus in on your uh, comment about, you know, if the Democrats tell you we're trying to take away pre-existing conditions, they're not being honest. Yeah. Okay, I get that the Republicans have come up with plans that will continue to protect that. However, you've never been successful in getting it passed, yeah. in getting it through. So that's where this issue comes in. If, if you're going to repeal one law without having another one ready to go and implement it, essentially you are doing it. No, no, this is where I'm just going to respectfully disagree, and that is in Congress we always had the second bill ready, and we could have passed that. But you can't do that until you've been able to repeal the original bill. Why are you so confident you could have been able to pass that? Well, because we knew we had the votes. We had the Republican majority and a Senate majority, and we knew right. we... we but if you take a look at the Affordable Care Act, one of the biggest problems is it had no Republican support. Yeah. So are we just going to continue to go in this cycle every time well, the pendulum of power swings? We're going to continue to reinvent the... That, that would have been obviously not our, not our intention nor our desire. But the, your, your question was, and the supposition was, you were going to repeal Obamacare, and we always had the replacement plan ready to go. We could have, we could not, look, it was a harder vote to repeal Obamacare than it was to vote on the replacement. Again, we had Republican House, Republican Senate, Republican President. We were confident we could have immediately voted for the replacement plan. Well, I think I think that's the worst case uh, scenario is for the for the court to rule it unconstitutional because then we're we're behind on the political process, um, and honestly, we don't have the majority in the in the House right now. I mean, Miss Pelosi uh, would be making that decision if we have a Republican majority in the House. You know, in the future, uh, hopefully, our our, uh, our own party and our own leadership has uh, anticipated that vote and is prepared to replace it at that time. Thanks. In the last few weeks of this, I mean, the polling shows you enjoy a very comfortable lead. Um, you know, are you just cruising in November? No, you never cruise. And I mean, you, of course, you expect me to say that. I mean, the last thing in the world I'm going to say, because I don't feel that way, is, and I mean, you'd have to be a terrible politician to say, yeah, we're just cruising. You know, we know we're going to win. No big deal. Uh, but we sincerely work really hard on this. I think we have a responsibility to work really hard. I have responsibility to the people in the district to make myself available, to explain my uh, views, to explain why I hope that they would agree with me. Uh, so we always run hard, and I always will. And by the way, I don't know, we don't know what, uh, what the actual polling is. We've done our own internal polling, but uh, we, we've seen very little polling outside of that. In fact, I don't know that I've seen any, so. The one that's got you on debate floor. Yeah, the yeah. The is, is one that shows you enjoying a very comfortable Yeah. Yeah, and, and so I forgot that one. I'm sorry, but I, and I'm not aware of any other. And Ben, I'd be interested if you are aware of another one that I've just missed. But uh, but again, we we never take that for granted. And the day you do is the day you're going to lose and embarrass yourself. Representative, you were very clear on your stance on the Supreme Court. Yeah. Could I have made myself any more clear on that? <laughs> <laughs> one thing I'd like to ask you is, would we be here having that conversation if Republicans would have taken up Garland in 2016? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know if we would have been here or not. We probably would, actually, because there's been, uh, you know, uh, several openings since then. Uh, and I think we would have ended up in exactly the same place we are right now. Anytime you have a vacancy in the last year of a president's term, uh, it's, I think you're going to find yourself in this kind of controversial and kind of divisive environment. It's happened 29 times. Um, and I think it's probably much the same in not all of those, but probably in many of them. So I guess I would ask the same question I asked about health care. Are we just going to continue to go back and forth every time the power changes in Washington? On well, that? again, I hope not. And if they don't, if they don't pack the court, we won't, because then uh, if there's a vacancy, the party who's in the majority is going to be able to fill that vacancy. The party who owns the White House or controls the White House is going to be able to fill that vacancy. Um, so I think it's a, a little bit different in the sense that uh, vacancies aren't like legislation. You, you can repeal legislation. You can't repeal 
uh, an appointment to the Supreme Court. It's a lifetime appointment. So uh, I think I, I, I get the sense of what you're asking, but I do think that there are some, you know, pretty, pretty meaningful differences between the two, the two analogies or the two examples. Oh, look, that's easy. Uh, these things are hard. I mean, suicide prevention took us four and a half years. The coalition we built over, uh, over the Wild Horse and Burrows is a seven or eight year effort. Uh, the work we're, we're doing on fa fairness for all based on the co compromise, we know that's going to be a long, long road. And uh, we anticipate, anticipate the same thing for the, uh, for the national park. Very few things go through Congress in one session. Um, and we're, we're willing to do the work to keep at it, but we know it's going to take some time. Representative, uh, we've already mentioned the Republican nature of your district. However, there's a portion of Salt Lake City that is very Democratic. Uh, how do you view your responsibility of, of yeah. representing them as well? Yeah, look, and that's a great question, and, and it's one that I answer, and I'm really serious about this, very sincere, but it's, it's very difficult in the sense that uh, remember Bernie Sanders won in the, in the presidential election in Utah in 2016. Uh, look, he's an avowed socialist. He has been his entire life. There isn't much that he and I agree on. And the reason I point that out is to say some of those folks in Salt Lake City uh, disagree with me on almost everything. We, we just see the world differently. But I still feel like I have responsibility for them to know that I'm going to listen to them and give them opportunities to at least express their views and actually try to understand them, which is, again, why I mentioned this town hall. 1,300 people there, they were angry, but I felt a responsibility to do that. We do that all the time. Uh, meet with people in the avenues in, in, uh, in West Valley, in Magna. Uh, but it's more than just showing up, Glenn, because, I mean, it'd be easy to just show up and I could sit there and read a book or take phone calls. you got to actually listen to them. And you got to help him understand. I understand your point of view. We may disagree, but I understand your point of view. And I just think any representative has a responsibility to do that. Can you share an example of how you've done that? Well, I think I did tonight. I mean, the Fairness for All is a bipartisan, uh, bipartisan uh, effort. Well, wait, I'm going to stop myself. An example of how I've tried to listen to people? Is that what you're asking? Uh, well, again, I'm, then I'm going to continue. Fairness Fall is a great example of that. I mean, that started with conversations from uh, some LGBTQ activists who I listened to them and I thought, they've got a great point. Isn't there something we could do that would protect uh, their legitimate concern about discrimination in the public sphere, housing, employment, you know, the ability to sit on a jury? And it's, at the same time, you know, affect what was an important issue for some other people, and that's religious liberty and I think that's a good example that started from conversations of listening to people hi representative Stewart this is Emily means from KUER um, I wanted to go back to health care if I can I mean obviously it's something that's on a lot of people's minds with the pandemic um, and you know Utah has fully expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act uh, Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes has signed on to a lawsuit to repeal the law. And, you know, just now you've said the Republican Party has a plan if the ACA is repealed um, regarding pre-existing conditions. But I'm wondering what the plan is for Utahns who now have coverage under Medicaid through the ACA uh, if the Affordable Care Act is repealed. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, look, I, it's hard for me to say how the Supreme Court is going to rule on this. Um, but if they do, I, uh, my expectation would be uh, that they would give Congress time to put a replacement in place. They're not going to rule on a Tuesday and have Ob Obamacare, the ACA, go away on Wednesday morning. Uh, I, again, my expectation from those who are experts in the court proceedings would say they would give us time to formulate a replacement and to have time to work that through the political process. And I certainly hope that would be the case. We good? Any, any last questions from Zoom? Okay. Thanks, everyone. Good, Appreciate it.